You can have that. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, take a look at it. You know, if I do this, maybe I can recollect some of the stuff. Sure. You want to do, do that for me? Why don't you do that? Yeah. Why don't you read it? Read it aloud? Yeah, absolutely. What <coughs> Let me see. Okay. This is good. Where'd you get it from, Harold? Yeah. <laughs> these were five-minute reports, but this looks longer than that. Well, it's, uh, these are all of your reports. Oh, really? All six days. So you, we can play around with one of them. Maybe this is the Rudolf Hess work. The hollow-cheeked Nazi who sits like a scarecrow and walks like a stiff-jointed mechanical fa Frankenstein bursts forth with a surprise today that seems extremely... Do you think, should I let it, lead it, read it all? Sure. Just well, to get the copy? Absolutely. Uh, Uh, extremely unusual even for historic flight to England in May 1941. Oh, this is about... Uh, Rudolf Hess. Yeah. For it in his defense that Rudolf Hess would not take the witness stand in his own behalf. Hess's reasons, known most of the time only to himself, anyway, were not indicated, not even in uh, gossip that reverberated through the halls of this labyrinth-like palace of justice. But the sudden decision by the former Hitler deputy who once ran the affairs of the Nazi party was not without effect on the newsmen who filed into the press gallery this morning with the hope of hearing the child's number one mystery man. Those who remembered this outburst of early trial days in which he showed defiantly that his claims to amnesia were just part of a tactical act, were claims to amnesia were just part of a tactical act were definitely let down because Rudolf Hess has been clear in indicating that anything he can happen whenever he can, he's concerned. Harold wrote this, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I didn't read it. I just I read it, but I didn't write it. Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty good copy, though. <laughs> it What did I have? Five copy? Five or six? Oh, f six. I think I had six. six. Five, I mean. Five minutes, yeah. Yeah. Hess's defense, which began with a statement by Reese, oh, by his attorney, that Hess does not believe the Four Nation International Military Tribunal has jurisdiction to proceed against him highlighted two witnesses, neither of them very good. But the mission of both was to show that the Nazi party didn't use its offices abroad to form the nucleus of a fifth column, not alone in Europe, European countries, but in the United States as well, in the forum of the German-American Bund. Before the uh, controversy, contradictory evidence of the uh, two witnesses flowed through the translating equipment, Hess's attorney, in some of the gaps of his advert adventure, some, some client's trip to England five weeks before the Germans marched against the Soviet Union. Included in the declaration was an account of a secret meeting between Hess and representatives of the session only as Dr. Godfrey for security reasons. 
wait a minute, between Hess and representatives of the British Foreign Office, particularly Lord Simon, known in this session only as Dr. Godfrey for security reasons. <laughs> it, it was this, this secret meeting that Hess laid down four stipulations to bring peace between England and Germany. First, a clear definition of spheres of influence of the two nations, Germany to get all of Europe, England, the empire. Second, the return of Germany's pre-World War I, pre -World War I colonies. Third, the payment of indemnities that apply to both nations. And fourth, that England makes peace with Italy at the same time. These proposals, Rudolf Hess told the British, had been re repeatedly in indicated by Hitler himself as a possible basis for an understanding between the two countries. This is good stuff. I didn't. I didn't remember. This is great stuff. <laughs> he wrote it, and I read it. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> That's nice. See, I have bad eyesight too. At that point, the small staccato speaking German lawyer attempted to introduce what was described as a secret treaty subscribed to by Germany and the Soviet Union and signed the same day as the well known German Russian non aggression pact of. August 1939. <clears throat> the document, the lawyer explained, had just uh, come to his attention. For that reason, he had not applied to the tribunal for permission to use it. Also had been unable, for lack of time, to have it translated into English, French, and Russian. <clears throat> As he began reading the, its contents, the chief Soviet prosecutor, General R. A. Rudenko, was on his uh, feet. General Rudenko did not know of the existence of such a document. The product, he protested, and he voiced his uh, strenuous objections against the use of it. There was a there was a hushed. Oh, any voices? In, uh, there was a hushed silence in the courtroom. Presiding Justice Jed Jeffrey Lawrence called for a ten-minute uh, re recess. When the judges returned, he announced that the tribunal must first see translated into uh, a chant translated, he announced that the, the tr tribunal must first see translated copies of the document before they will announce if it can be introduced. The German lawyer came back with his intention to apply for the foreign commissar of the Soviet Union, V.M. Molotov, as a witness. But for the time being, the subject was dropped. The witnesses who hesitated, who, who headed Germany's political organizations abroad, painted their uh, legions in terms of cultural and social groups composed of Germans who got their, who got together according to the something to drink beer and to discuss the fatherland. But before Allied prosecutors left their cross-examination, few in the courtroom donate, uh, doubted that their main purpose of who Meyer Road? Well, anyway, had a two-word description, fifth column. It's 
good stuff. I guess I should have known it when I would stop. <laughs> I just said, just read it and shut up. Uh, this has been the AFN correspondence, Harold Burson and Herb Capelo speaking from the Palace of Justice, Nuremberg. We return you now to the AFN newsroom in Frankfurt. That's terrific. It's good. It's, oh my God, that's. Just, I didn't remember what he what I was reading. I yeah, guess yeah. it was only sixty years ago. Well, should I go on and read it all now? Well, that's not necessary. But this is. I want to read it. Oh, it's absolutely. That's yours. That's your. Okay, copy. fine. You can have that's that. great. But oh, I was delighted to find that after you and I talked that Harold had kept that. I'm for you. He should have. You know that. I didn't. All I did was read the stuff. And uh, so I didn't really remember it, but it's nice to have. Well, in that particular, uh, Dave, when you read that, that was pretty dramatic. Because not only everybody's wondering, didn't know whether Hess would actually testify, and he didn't. Then they introduced this, the non-aggression pact, the agreement between Hitler and Stalin, which yeah. nobody had ever seen. They knew it was out there, but nobody had ever seen the yeah, document. Yeah. So there's kind of a couple of bombshells yeah. that you, you read about. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Well, I think we I think we suspended right after the last one because they were they were going to take a break and mm -hmm. do all the sort of tedious work and re return. I don't know a couple of months later. Yeah. It looks like there's six separate uh, sessions that you have there. And uh, is that about the time, the total time period you were there? I think I did five programs. Maybe it was five, yeah. I think it was five. And it was because the guy who had been doing it was being discharged. He was being let go home and they needed somebody to do it. Okay. And, then, and then after I did my, the five, then I think that they took a break. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they took a break. They had a lot more work to do quietly, but I think that they came back, I don't know, a couple of months later, and I don't know who took over from that. How did you get there? What was it that caused you to end up at Nuremberg? Well, all right, I'll tell you. I was drafted in 19, in about, uh, I guess, January, March, uh, April, I think, of 45. Mm -hmm. And what guys who were drafted then all were being sent to train for infantrymen. Mm -hmm. And so I went into Georgia and for the infantry training. And it was 17 weeks. And on about the 13th or 14th, the war ended. Yeah. Good timing. So instead of going to the Far East, which is what we expect, were expected just to be infantrymen, we, they started to send people to Europe and to let the other people go home. And so I went and first I was a clerk for in the headquarters of the 3rd Infantry Division. And then somehow I, I don't know, I, they were looking for people for AFN and I guess I mentioned something and, and the major sort of gave me a, didn't think, a, gave me a no chance of doing it. He just mumbled. But about three weeks later, he said, first I went up to Kassel, Germany, mm -hmm. where we had a station. And then they closed Kassel down. And then they, because we were cons contracting, and uh, they sent all of us to uh, in Nuremberg. Not Nuremberg, in, in Frankfurt, but in Heck, in what's, what was it? A smaller town, right outside, and that's where we were had a station there, a lovely place, right on the river. And then, I first I started to spin records, and then they started to give me other things to do. I did some sports, I did news, I did some other things, and then one day they said go to Nuremberg. So you you go to Nuremberg. What was the city like at the time? Well, I was trying to remember whether it was badly battered. It, I, don't, I don't think it was, it was battered, I think. But of course, the Palace of Justice, that the building, 
is, is ste uh, strong and up and there. And uh, I, I wish I could remember where I slept and things like that, but but there we were. I mean, there were 20 guys who needed to be killed. Yeah. And uh, and that that was it. In the courtroom itself, as you're looking out, looking towards the the front, where uh, where where was the where was the radio booth? I think it was up, looking out at at the uh, room. So sort of the back where the spectators I, were. Yeah, I think so. I can't remember that very much, but I think it was a window or something. So you sat there and you actually, did, did you observe a lot of the trial while you were waiting? Yes, yeah. Yeah. I, I, all the time because I, I could go for morning to late afternoon while Harold was doing the editing and writing <laughs> and doing, doing the real work. And I remember it was at least the five days and it may have been a couple of others. Oh yeah, my God. So when you get up in that booth that first day and you look out and you see a Hermann Goering, what do you think? Well, I can't remember the exact words, but I know that I was mystified every day I was there, mm -hmm. thinking, my God, you know what this is? This could have been 6,000 years ago, too. This was comparable to that kind of historic uh, bad. And uh, I was aware all the time that this was a pretty big experience. Right. I wish, I, I guess I could have stayed longer, but I, but I think p probably because they had suspended for a while to do a lot of the tedious work right. that I went back to Frankfurt and uh, did things there. As I mentioned a couple of names, and just if you have any any reaction to them, like Rudolf Hess. Yeah, well, Rudolf Hess was right, the guy who went to England, and he was sitting next to uh, Goering. Goering. Goering was, Goering was in this. They had, I think, three tiers, three or four, and Goering was in the first chair, and Hess there, and then the far, the foreign policy guy. Ribbentrop. Ribbentrop. They were the but Goering and Goering from the beginning thought he was the big man and he was you know and uh, commanding himself and apparently in the early in the in the uh, trial before I was there Goering did take almost take over and he was t talking a lot and commanding and everything and uh, it looked pretty <laughs> pretty strange yeah. but after a while he didn't he started to slide and when the, the more of the uh, testimony and all of that came out and all the dramatic appearances yeah. then Goering went, did, did lost that commanding of what about Julius Stryker well you mentioned it now yeah. Julius Stryker of course was the biggest anti-semite and Son of a bitch, and, the, and apparently he yelled Heil, Heil Hitler when they were stringing him up. Mm -hmm. Was that so? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard that that he still did it, and uh, yeah, he was I think in the second tier. Albert Speer. Yeah, Albert. Speer. Albert Speer, was he the? Uh, who was the guy? He was the architect. That's right. Yeah, and he got twenty years, didn't he? Correct. Yeah. Uh, you see, I'll give you a. Okay, have a. Yes. Oh, yeah, thank you. I went to try to find a, a book yesterday on this, uh, and I couldn't. But I used the computer and saw a little. Who else was there? The military guys. Kaito and Yodel. Yo, did they get electrocuted? Yeah, uh, they got hanged. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could still cannot figure out Poppin, Franz Poppin, why he got off. Uh, I think he was just out of the war so long. I mean, he was there at the beginning. He was a major player yeah. at the beginning, but during the 38, 39, 40s. 
Oh, was that when he was active? Well, no, he was active early on, 32, 33, yeah. 34. So uh, he was pretty much out of the war, and I think that's what sort of gave him a pass. Uh, uh, Fritchie, another guy got acquitted. He was the radio guy. Yeah. He just didn't think there were three who were let go, I yeah, think. Uh, uh, Von Poppen, uh, um, shot. Yeah, the the almost, the almost shot. shot. That's right. Yeah. Uh, because again, same thing. He ended up in a concentration camp. In a German concentration. Yeah. Yeah, because he was. Yeah. Hitler kind of lost lost faith in him, and so they at the end of the war. Yeah. So doesn't mean they weren't involved, but they weren't involved at when yeah. things were really heated. Yeah. Uh, so that was all interesting. I'm curious. How did the day work? You get to the 10 o'clock, I, th I think is when the uh, morning session start. You'd observe, probably take your own notes, but more just observe. And at some point, Harold comes up and hands you this, what we just read here. Yeah. What time was that? Would it would have been? I think, a, I think the copy he gave me was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. I don't know whether that's accurate, but it was in the afternoon sometime. And that's, that was your slot? Uh, I walked into the booth and bang, and I read his words. <laughs> and uh, did you have many, am I interface with Harold? Did he did? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would go. I would stay in the up in the gallery as much as I could. Right. I mean, didn't want to miss this. And then I'd go back into a booth somewhere, and Harold would give me the copy, and that was it. I knew you know you mentioned that Harold had a, a buddy there named Alan Dreyfus. Right, right, right. What do you remember about the two of those guys? They were very close, and I think you know I think they were very bright and very, very, you know, a one people in every way I guess. And I don't know who. Oh, he was with Stars and Stripes, I think. Correct. Yeah, they had a number of people. That, yeah. But you said he died recently. No, he's still living. He's uh, he's out in the Midwest somewhere. <laughs> Correct. He's in uh, Ann Arbor. Uh huh. And Har Harold is in touch with him, I guess. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were close friends. Yeah. Harold's in New York City. Yeah. Oh boy, we know he's in New York. <laughs> he's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, he had quite a career. Yeah. Uh, as you, as you look at the that opportunity to be there for the five or six days. The, did you have a chance to talk to the other media people at all? Oh, but I, a little bit, but I was uh, my gaping because they were all heroes of mine. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mumbled something and they were nice, but they were busy and Harold, Howard K. Smith, uh, what's his name, uh, the CBS guy. Oh, Cronkite. Cronkite was there. Uh, I said Marguerite Higgins was there. Uh, I don't remember some of the others. Andy Rooney, was Andy there? Do you remember him? Or? Well, I told you the story about, <laughs> what's his name, uh, that woman's at this seminar oh, talking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why don't you, what do you, what, what do you think I did? And she said, how did it feel when you were in a, one of the camps? Yeah, yeah. How did it, what do you think it was? <laughs> he really right. And then he sort of softened up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, there, there were some others there I, I can't remember. As you, just reading, even reading the script, and part of uh, what you had for the other days was uh, Riebentrop. He, he was the testified, and that was part, part of what you, you have here. Yeah. Um, did, you, did you get a sense that you were involved in something historic at the time? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, most of the other things you see, but you look, and you're, as I said, about 25, 30 yards away from them. Mm -hmm. And there are these guys sitting there. And it didn't lessen either. So I, even now, I think, my God, yeah. here I was 19 years old, and here were the people who were like the tyrants of history ever. and. Yeah. Even now, I think think about it. Again, you've had such a distinguished career. Was the fact that you being Jewish covering something which 
there was a prosecution of those who really focused in on anti-Semitism. Did, did, did that affect your thinking at all? I'm sure it did because I came, for one thing, from a pretty orthodox, conservative Jewish family, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, you know, so I guess I may have had a deeper feeling about that. But I'm sure, I'm sure, just about everybody who was there, all so up close to history, right. that it was deep. Even though people were running around doing that work, but you know. I'm sure they all came out too, saying uh, the biggest story I ever call right. uh, covered was Nuremberg. As, and whatever they, whatever their background, whatever their religion, I'm sure they were deeply affected. Right, right. How do you think that experience at age 19, and really, was that one of your first broadcasting experiences? Well, I was. As I had I was in college, and that's when I was drafted, and uh, Syracuse, right? No, Queens College. Queens, okay, yep, yep. yep. Yeah, and so I, I after in my sophomore week, junior year, then I was drafted, and uh, just lucky that they needed me, and I was there, and so they said, "All right, you go," and uh, my God. In a sense, I could say my first biggest story was my first story ever since, you know. And now it was all downhill. <laughs> Not at all. No, you've had some big stories. Uh, when you left. Let me know, Frank, when it's. Let's see. I came here a quarter after. I just want to make sure I don't get a ticket. Sure. So it's about, I think, about another. I'll stay as long as you want, but I don't want to get stuck in that. No, no. So, okay, it's about. In about 20 minutes, I'll throw another quarter in. Um, as you left the story, where'd you go from there? Did you head back to Frankfurt? Yeah, yeah. What was it? Was what was where? It was outside of uh, Frankfurt. Another time, the name of the little town. It was a beautiful, right on the river, and yeah. we had a castle that we lived that we lived or lived in, or down the road we had a, yeah. a building to take over. Did you follow it? Did you continue the, the list or follow the Nuremberg story? Yeah, I'm Was sure. that of interest? Oh, yeah. 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 How'd you find you, now did you stay in until, uh, when did you come back to the States? About uh, November, I guess, of yeah. that year. That's when they said, it's time for you to go home. Yeah. You'll have. And so I, I, I almost wanted to stay. I mentioned that to an old, uh, he was a civilian now, he had been in the, uh, what was his name? He, I said, gee, maybe I ought to go home. This man who was the sort of helpful and advisor said, go home, go home. Because I went, and when I got back here, uh, I, there was some talk about doing, staying in AFN in New York. Oh, was that right? Yeah, and they, but then this didn't work out. At some point you find yourself with uh, NBC. Yep. How, how did that happen? I graduated from Queens. I then worked for a, at a little radio station in New Jersey. And then I went to Northwestern for graduate work. Mm -hmm. And as I got ready there, I went up to NBC in New York, and there just happened to be an open opening. And I was a, a young guy, and you know, doing guys, low work. And, uh, and then I did that for about two years, three years, mostly health. Morgan Beatty, I don't know if you remember that name. I was, I was his lackey, and then after about three years of NBC, they started giving me real work going around to lots of places. Well, you you covered Brown versus Board of Education decision. Yep. yep. Was that ex was that an exciting period of time? Yep. Because yep. I was in on it pretty quite a bit. I mean, I was all of the bills started the bills started to ring on the teletypes on what. What was the month of May? May 17th. 17th, 1954. Right. Well, the Supreme Court today 
decided that separate education is the wrong education. Yeah, that was a, and then it, that was about altogether for maybe ten years back and forth. Not one you know, we'd run down to the south and then say, hey, and that was a big, big story, and a very satisfying story. Well, you covered it uh, extensively, and uh, including the Freedom Riders. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you get a? Did you ever feel yourself in harm's way? <laughs> we were bad. Well, in one place, in where was it? In Alabama, somewhere. Montgomery? Uh, yeah, Montgomery. We, uh, the camera, camera crew and I followed the Freedom Riders from someplace into Montgomery. Birmingham, probably to Montgomery. Birmingham, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were at, a little ahead of them. And uh, was, we were waiting, for, we meaning the crew and I, waiting for the Freedom Riders to get into Montgomery. Some nice friends, fellows. So it would be high, feisty, and then when the bus stopped but the people came out, that's when they started to bang them away at them. And they went after our cameraman. He got hit a bit because he was making the camera film. Sure. We just pushed down the street and uh, waited until we could get back. And uh, that was a big, it was an interesting thing. I think it was that year. When we came back, there were other bad guys banging away, and they went after a black guy. Now, I'm not too sure about all this. I may even have it mixed up with another time, but I think it was that. And there was a black man on the street being batted away, and the uh, main policeman. Bull Connor? No. Okay. No, he was a bad guy. It was another a very good, went up and stood in front of this black guy and with a pistol said to the other bad guys, you do anything, I'll blast you. And he saved them. He was, oh the, he was the commissioner of, of, uh, under, uh, I don't know what it was other on uh, the names, but he was a guy and he tried to save that man. Yeah. He was, uh, you know, Fred, what was his name, Fred something. Wow. Uh, you also had a chance to go to Cuba. Went several times, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, uh, four or five times. Was this uh, pre-Castro? Well, it was. It was, and also when Castro came in. Okay. We were there before he came, came what, east, west, whatever, mm -hmm. I guess east. Uh, yeah, we were there before that. And then we were there <laughs> the night, New Year's Eve of yeah. what, seven, 57, 47, and it, we were in Havana and we were being told, you know, something's going to happen, and a guy named Castro was down in San, quite Santa, San West, down in the West, I guess, and uh, I was with a British reporter, and it was New Year's Eve, yeah. and we uh, were having something to eat. And now Stringer came up and whispered into our ears that it looks as though there's activity at, uh, what's his name? Uh, Batista's? Batista's. He has a lot of activity around his house. And well, so anyway, we, we weren't sure, but he was watching for us. We went back to the hotel. I went to bed at about uh, four o'clock in the mor morning. We, somebody at the embassy called us and said, it looks as though, uh, what's his name? Batista. Batista is fleeing. And then a couple of hours later, we started hearing noises and gunshots and stuff. We were at the top of this hotel. Day, and uh, I got some telephone calls into New York. And uh, they were yeah, shooting and... Uh, and uh, knocking off the parking meters and a couple of things like that. And it, w one guy we saw, uh, I worked on, managed to get out of the hotel later in the afternoon and there was a dead guy on the street. We didn't get much television in for the first few days because it was hard to get it, but finally we were able to broadcast from there. You're one of the first, you were there. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Funny thing was that the, uh, the guy who had been having dinner with me, a British reporter, uh, he went off, and when we finished dinner, he went on his way and he picked up a woman and had a good time at night. And about, I don't know, five in the morning or so, he called me up in the hotel and said, what's going on? And I said, what, what's going on? He said, I just got uh, back. And I said, well, I'll, here's what, and your office in London is looking for you. He said, oh my God, but he, he was really sick. And anyway, he finally caught up with it, but he had had his fun and then came back. He almost missed the story. <laughs> he, well, he was he was concerned. I tried to cover for him, you yeah, know, yeah. But, yeah. but and then we were back uh, when the new people came in, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of funny things that happened there, and uh, and uh, I spoke to Castro. I was on with Castro on Meet the Press, Is that I think, right? in Washington. I think once or twice, and I went into. Uh, on a night that uh, the Russian cosmonaut was in, he came to Cuba and he had a big party for him. And we wanted his cameraman, uh, another guy and I, were trying to get into the palace to get in there, but we were very, we thought that we wouldn't, he wasn't the favorite. But finally we sort of got into the we walked into the palace, the cap, palace, Where? and there were these guys all with weapons. Where? And they said, Buenos dias. And they said, ha, 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 and they let us in. And I went up to Castro and started to chat him a little bit. He was eating stuffing food. And my damn cameraman disappeared. I don't know where he was, but, but he, I said, the, a night before that, an airplane had been held in Cuba. They, and he said, told me, he said, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to let them go tomorrow. Yeah. And he did let them go. And I told, I once went to the Bay of Pigs and we went, when he went there and we tried to cover him. I should have tried to talk to him, but I wasn't sure that it was prudent. Right. So, but and we, I spent, there were a lot of funny things that happened, crazy things, you know. <laughs> So you were there when Yuri Gagarin was there? That's the cosmonaut? The yes, Russian. well that was what that dinner was yeah. for. He was the, okay. yeah. No, that was a good story and it's still a good story. Still is a great story. Yeah. And yeah. probably not, a lot of it has been told. Have you, have you ever written anything about, you know, kind of your life? And no, I have, my wife is pushing me and I, I have probably about a uh, hundred pages or something. When I'm dead, my kids can finish it. <laughs> but a lot, a lot of stuff like that. It, there is a lot, but it's hard work to do to do a good book. Yeah, yeah. What well, what was the story? What was the story? The Herb Capital story that says this is the one I really remember the most. Well, of course, it's the the, uh, the civil rights story. Right. Was probably the most significant story. The uh, the Bay of Pigs was. Okay. Uh, oh, I, I, there are a lot, a lot of big ones. Well, well, you went with Nixon to China. Yeah, yeah. I covered him a lot. Mm -hmm. I was just I covered, I covered him for the first time uh, in 1956 when he was vice running for vice president. Mm -hmm. And I covered that, and then once you get assigned to somebody, you sort of get them forever. So I covered in 1956. I not, did in 1958, we went to South America. Oh, that's where we also, he was vice president and he was going this. And there we got rocks thrown on us by in, in uh, Venezuela and also in Peru, I guess. Really in bad, almost rocks phone. Uh, and then I knew, then a lot of things right up until he was out, I was covering Nixon, uh, although, yeah, pretty much until 50. As you cover these people, do you really get the chance to, to really 
know them. Yeah. 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 Nixon seems to be such an enigma. Did you get, did you get a good impression of? Well, I think I thought they were. I mean, he was. He had problems. Right. Real problems, and uh, but. At the same time, there were other things. He was pretty able man. He was did some pretty good things. Yeah. I mean, significant things, foreign policy and other. He did it with on some domestic things. I mean, bigger than most presidents have done. But he had he had a few bad days. Yes, real he did. If you had to do it all over again, uh, we'll kind of wrap this up. But if no, you, that's all right. I just want to make sure I get yeah. throw some more quarters in. Yeah, if we uh, if you had to do it all over again, uh, are there some stories that sort of got away from you? The ones where you say, "Gee, I I knew a little bit about it, but I didn't follow up." The, you know, it's like the big fisherman who lost the big fish. Oh, there are times when you, yeah, that you. Most of that, what it's not so much you've done it. You've told your superiors, here is a story that's very good, and it, often they brushed us away because they didn't understand it. Right. I mean, I try to say, I had this story. That was more that. Yeah, but us, otherwise, I'm sure we. I remember that when, who was it, the, the black guy who got, he went to a college out there, and he got shot at, gunshot. And I had a rush there, and I said it was buck, buck shot or bell shot, and it was the wrong one. I said, said it was the, the wrong one, and it made a difference because it would show that the guy wasn't really trying to kill him. He was just trying to wound him rather than so that. Sure, we've, we've had times when things are, you, you've missed it, because it's really fast and dirty most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Who was your hero as you were kind of working your way through these broadcast system? Guys, you looked up to and said, "Gee, I would asp I aspire to be like the broadcaster that you wanted to be most like." Well, uh, I don't know. There are some there. Like, What's his name? Who died in California? Uh, he was in Vietnam a lot. There were a lot of people I admired. The uh, political figure that I admire is George Shultz. Yeah, yeah. He was, I think, maybe the best and smartest and nicest. Yeah. Do you? You you knew something about him then. Well, I've heard, certainly read about him. And he was a, he was, just, he told, twice he, Nixon or somebody in the, one of, people at State Department to do something, and and, uh, Shul said I'm not going to do it. Yeah. You know, loyalty oaths or something like that. Right. And he said no. I also have a very strong feeling that he was very responsible for Reagan making a deal with the Russians. Mm -hmm. I think that was, he did it through Mrs. Reagan. I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hopefully you'll get it done before you, you does it. <coughs> One of the things I'd like to do, I, I want to give you a couple things. Just This is a book on Jackson. Yeah. yeah. I'll give you that. Good, thank you. <clears throat> and this is a copy that I want to keep of what you've read. That's yours. But this is just another copy, but I'd like you to autograph that for me. I pleasantly. One of my big life.
My first big story, and maybe my biggest. Terrific! I got one more. For, since I'm gonna, I'll give you this. I want you to, I want you to just send a note, maybe to Harold Burson. I uh, will. This is on that one. Is it there? It's right here. Here's an extra one. This is yours. This is okay. yours to keep, and then maybe a little note to Harold. Okay. And I'll send it to him. I'll give it to you. You mean? Yeah, I'll, no. I'll send it to him. Yeah. I think you'd just get a hoot out of this. I'm saying the same thing, I guess. Sure. My first and maybe my biggest story, thanks for steering a new Herb Kaplow at Nuremberg. I think of it yet. I love it. That's <laughs> terrific. Well, this has been terrific. I can't thank you enough. And well, I'm glad we did it. I'm glad we did it, and uh, when you least expect it, we'll, we're going to invite Betty and you up to come to Chautauqua, New York. We would be delighted. And uh, see the Jackson Center, see Chautauqua Institution, and uh, uh, we can we can take this even much much further in the rest of your career. Okay, okay. so I'm going to keep this and I'm going to keep this and absolutely. this. Absolutely. And you're going to give Harold at my. Absolutely. Good. Are you giving me this or is this? That's that's so ragged. To, I, yeah. I will send you one though. I have okay. an extra one. I was looking through my library. I said I've got to have something in there, but I and I. I couldn't find anything. I'm sure I did, but then I. Uh, pumped away at the computer last night to remind <laughs> me of some things. This is good. Well, thank I, you very, very much. I